Hi everyone, how you doing? Welcome back from lunch. Didn't eat too much, I hope. Uh, can still can still pay attention. Um, so, I'm so happy to be able to, to moderate this this panel, which transitions from some of the sort of theory that we've been hearing this morning and kind of gets into a, a nitty gritty a little bit. I just want to um, set some expectations. So I think you'll find that the gist of this panel is actually the effect on behavioral advertising and on the behavioral advertising market of regulation um, or the absence of regulation. I think that's probably going to be the gist of what you hear. I'm not sure if that's um, uh, clearly delineated, but, but delineated by the economics of behavioral advertising as the title. But that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to be your moderator. Uh, my name is Ryan Kahlo. I'm with the Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society, where I focus uh, on, ro on robotics, actually, and also on privacy and run the research around there. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce um, uh, the panelists. Um, it's a really interesting, exciting, and diverse group of people. Um, and and uh, I'm really happy to have all of them here. Um, I, I'm, this, the organizers of this did just a phenomenal job in terms of who they, who they selected to participate. Um, so just to my, to my immediate left or right is uh, Eric Goldman, who's a law professor at Santa Clara. He's also the director of the High Tech Law Institute and was this year's recipient of the Vanguard Award uh, for uh, outstanding contributions to IP. He's also somebody that I, I cite a lot in my own work, although admittedly not always in agreement. Um, <laughs> okay, so to his left, um, uh, Laura Cornish is a marketing professor at the Leeds School of Business here at Colorado. Um, she's a PhD, I think from Stanford, right? Um, kind of a heavy Stanford panel um, in engineering economic systems. Um, and she studies innovation policy, among other things. Um, and then I think next we have Seth. Hi, Seth. <laughs> so Seth Levine is a, is a venture capitalist, and he's a managing director and co-founder of the Foundry Group. Um, so, you know, what's interesting about Seth is that he's part of this incredible ecosystem that is actually right here in Boulder, Colorado, around startups. It's actually so exciting to see uh, Boulder be another center of innovation um, in addition to Silicon Valley where, where I work. Um, and, uh, you know, I think part of what, uh, part of what leads to success is, is having this vibrant ecosystem, people willing to, to invest. Also, tolerating failure is very important. Um, which I hope you keep in mind, uh, given the selection of me as the moderator here, if uh, things don't go perfectly well. Um, all right, so after Seth, so thanks Seth, and then after that is Alicia McDonald. Um, Alicia actually works with the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford, um, and she is a, a PhD, she studied engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and she also actually co-chairs the World Wide Web Consortium on, uh, on a working group around Do Not Track. And so she's highly expert, and I hope we get to talk about that a little bit. Um, and then last, and certainly not least, is Catherine Tucker. Um, she's a professor in IT and management at the MIT Sloan School of Management, where she also teaches marketing, I think, Catherine, you also teach marketing. Um, and she studies, among other things, how data can drive marketing decisions, um, and then how to uh, address the inevitable and attendant privacy concerns that that might raise. And she's a PhD in economics, also from Stanford. Um, <laughs> you, just, you just imported Stanford for this purposes of... Um, all right, so I'm gonna, I, I think we probably want to do just a little bit of definitional work up front and talk a little bit about um, what behavioral, behavioral advertising means. And so I'd like to start off just asking Alicia a question. Um, can, you know, can you give a sense of what, what's meant by behavioral advertising? What does that term even mean? So you'll hear a little bit of debate about that, but generally at sort of a high level, it is advertising that's based on data that is collected about um, individuals, maybe not identifying them by name, uh, of online things like the websites they've visited, the search terms they've typed in, uh, and that data then goes to create a profile, uh, and from that profile then ads are served. So that can be done with third parties. Uh, it can also be done on a first party basis. So Amazon would be an example of a company that does some of each. So from a first party context, the things that you've purchased from Amazon then drive their recommendations for what you might also like to purchase in the future. But Amazon also works with a whole host of other third parties if they don't happen to have something in stock. And they can then create a profile based on the things that you purchased there as well. So you said it's, it's debated. I mean, 
why isn't that why isn't that bigger, broader picture of first and, and, and third party behavioral advertising just the norm? I mean, some people think that online behavioral advertising and tracking are only related to third parties, and that first parties are exempt from that definition. And does, that yeah, no, I was going to say. Um, so does anyone else? I mean, just want to open this up a little bit to the panel. Does anyone else want to add to that or weigh in one side or the other about whether the definition ought to include what Amazon does when it recommends something to you and Third-party tracking, any sense from anyone about that? You don't have to. So yeah, Laura. No, uh, I, um, I, I think when you say whether the definition ought to include, yeah. um, it depends what, what are we talking about. If we're talking about for regulation, then maybe it ought to not include the first party, but include the third party. Why is but that? in general, um, uh, well, in just that uh, expands the universe of who's sharing what information with whom, um, and possibly therefore threatening. Uh, privacy more, but in, I, I agreed with what she said. I actually didn't. I didn't find it controversial. No, no, no controversy. I it was nicely stated, <coughs> okay. Yeah. Well, Alicia has a knack for stating the controversial and uncontroversial uh, acceptable <laughs> ways. Um, so uh, maybe it's from working with the W3C3 uh, all this time. Um, so actually, Laura, let me stay with you for a second. So what we have right now, I think it's fair to say, and please push back if I'm wrong, what we have today really for behavioral advertising seems to be self-regulation as the model, right? Um, you know, do you think that model is working, can work? <coughs> the, um, let's see. So uh, about a year ago, the Interactive Advertising Bureau introduced the advertising option icon, uh, the, little, the little blue triangle with the eye on it that you'll see on some advertisements. And, uh, and you should be able to click on that advertisement and get some information about um, why, or click on the icon, I should say, and get some information about why you're being shown that ad. And, um, and so, as Ryan said, this is a, a self-regulation effort by industry. Let's all, let's all be good citizens and show, um, show the people you know, why we're showing them these ads. And um, you know, it's been around about a year uh, I've clicked on a lot of them. I, d I don't think it answers the question very well. The, the data that were, that were actually shown um, to me uh, doesn't seem to answer that question well of why I'm being shown the ad. So, so I feel like it's, you know, to answer your question, it's not, that, that doesn't seem to be working. And could could it work though? I mean, do you think it could? And, w and what would be the conditions under which it could work? The, um, I, well, so in, in noticing how unhelpful and uninformative that information is, I, I have asked myself, well, why is it like this? Is it is it technically challenging to offer that information? Is there some reason that the companies don't really want to tell that to me? Um, and, and I don't know enough to, to know the, the, those, those answers. So when you say, could it work? If it's a technical challenge in some way, um, then you know, that, would be, that would be a hurdle for, for it to actual, actually work. Um, but if, uh, you know, right now it seems, it seems much less than ideal. So I'm sorry, we keep pushing on this, and I, I know that you, you don't specifically do regulatory policy necessarily. I know although you look at the effects on innovation. Um, do you think with the proper incentives, um, you know, could you, could you imagine um, industry coming up with an effective way to do this kind of thing, where this kind of thing means you know, actually begin to protect consumers, actually inform them? Do you think that's possible? Um, well, I'm not going to solve that, that whole problem in, in you know, a few sentences. No, no, just a few um, sentences the, and, and we'll uh, <laughs> speak up. Oh, yeah. yep. oh, okay, fair enough. That's good, good to know. It, the, um, so, so what seems puzzling to me is, is there something that seems like it could work that would benefit both parties, the consumer and the advertiser, um, that, that we don't see? And, and that would be uh, you know, clear information about why I'm being shown this ad and me being able to give uh, informative feedback about uh, the parts of my online profile for which I'd like to see more ads. So maybe I've, I'm in the market for a cruise to Alaska and uh, I've looked at some sites and, and it knows that I've, I've, I'm doing that um, and, uh, and I see more information about that, more advertisements. That could be good. But then I have other parts of my online surfing behavior, um, some of it related to you know, a research project that I'm doing where I'm looking in at, at sites that I'm looking at, at kick scooters, which is not a personal interest of mine, um, and, and I'd like to be able to communicate, I'm not really interested in that, don't show me that. Mm -hmm. So I won't be, um, so I'm judged based on, on the profile that, that I'd like to have, and, um, and shown advertisements based on that profile. That seems like it would benefit the consumers, 
and it would benefit the companies. And maybe there's some technical challenge to that that I'm not aware of, but that, that seems like a direction uh, to move. So just sort of building on, on uh, the previous panel a little bit, and I'll open this up to, to everyone if you want to weigh in, although Laura, of course, you as well. Um, are we more likely to get there um, with self-regulation, uh, or are we more likely to get there um, with regulatory intervention? Uh, Ryan, can you clarify the there? The there, right. So, <laughs> can you clarify the there? I'm the moderator. I'm going to know. Uh, no, right. So, so right. So, what's the there? Is the, is maybe the first part? I mean, so where, Laura? What, let's start with you. Where are our goal, What are our goals? Do you think um, uh, in, in in thinking about regulating the space? And then we'll go to Eric. Mm, I feel like you, you've kind of you you mix you now put me in charge of having goals for the regulation too. Um, I'm putting a lot of onus on you, Laura. Yeah. I know. Yeah. The uh, so actually, maybe we could just. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna pivot the question. Sure. Um, so if you just take the there as my idea that that uh, the consumers should be able to have a little more control and input um, over over the their profile as as it's as it's seen, um, that could be a there. And your question then could be, do we get there through regulation or through? Um, Free, free market mechanisms, and I know Seth is dying actually to answer to weigh in on this. <laughs> yeah. I think we just all do in the headlights. I think Eric's, Eric's up next. Um, so yeah, Eric, jump in. <laughs> uh, wait, okay, ping pong. Just, uh, <laughs> hey, Peter, what do you say? <laughs> you know, uh, I'm going to totally change your question, um, but uh, I mean, I start with the premise: what is advertising? And in my world, it is a conversation between marketers who want to sell stuff and consumers who want to buy stuff. That conversation is going to have collateral damage in the sense that some of the people that the marketers are communicating with are never going to want to buy the product. And if we could only have perfect targeting that would get the advertising only in the people who would uh, bind it valuable, then we would all win from that. Um, those of us who are interested wouldn't be part of this conversation, and those who want to be part of the conversation would be included in it. So. Um, from my perspective, the there, there that we're talking about is how can we improve that conversation? How can we figure out a way yeah. to enable the conversation to take place between marketers who have something to sell and consumers who might actually want to buy? Um, in my mind, then, a lot of the focus on behavioral advertising kind of misses the point. We're saying there's a special class of ways that that conversation is being structured. Um, and it comes back again, is this actually helping consumers or hurting consumers? If it's helping consumers, then the whole notion, the architecture of um, regulating it is misguided, right? Wait, wait there, we actually are having a win here. The marketplace is doing what we want it to do. So um, we might disagree whether it is helping that conversation, but I'm interested in that conversation and making sure that conversation takes place in a way that ultimately advances both uh, uh, participants in it. Um, so Seth, let me, let me get involved in the question in a slightly different way, right? So do you think that investors are more comfortable with the current self-regulatory regime or would they be more comfortable with some ground rules that were top down? I'll, I'll do what the last two answers did, which is pivot the question a little bit. Um, so I would say this. I think that, and this, this might be surprising because I have capitalist is actually in my job title, um, but I actually think that um, a certain framework is, it can be helpful. I mean, generally I'm in favor of market solutions to the many problems, including these sorts of problems, especially when they relate to an individual's actions and relationship with uh, another economic party. I think that that's, uh, generally speaking, the market is best served when, when the market figures it out. Um, it is sometimes helpful to have a little bit of a framework, and, th and there, are, there are various, there have been various attempts at putting framework around uh, behavioral advertising, and, and I can tell you, having been on the other side, so my firm uh, has invested in a number of uh, online advertising uh, technologies, uh, although interestingly, not in any uh, behavioral, uh, like data, uh, specifically data companies, although we do have companies that make use of data. Um, and there is real conversation about hashing PII information, things like that. So, I mean, wh when there is a framework, businesses do actually stop, think about that, and say, okay, well, what do we need to do to comply to it? I think it needs to be a re relatively loose framework, and I think especially when you're talking about technology, technology that changes very quickly, I think the best solutions are technology solutions because those are the only solutions. How long have we been talking about privacy and privacy regulation, right, and what's happened in the internet in that time period? I think those are the only solutions that would likely keep up with the marketplace. All right, so Laura and Eric got away from me here, but I, I don't, I'm not going to let you get away from me. So this is why. So 
You have, you have access to a really unique perspective that a lot of the people in this room don't necessarily have access to, and it's not actually a, a conversation that's talked about enough, right? So you're in a position to invest in these companies that might do, say, we have behavioral advertising. Do you ever get nervous uh, because you're thinking to yourself, gosh, what is the FTC going to do? What is this stupid company going to do to itself because they're 18 years old, and you know what I mean, or whatever? I mean, do you ever get nervous about that? And does it, does it thinking about, like, well, gosh, if there were a really good framework in place, I would be less nervous about it. Does that ever come up in your mind? I don't, I don't know that many of... Uh, I, no, I don't think about wanting more regulation, so that's not... Uh, <laughs> I thought I'd sure I don't get... get Whatever I say, let's make sure I don't get quoted Seth, on that. Seth says um, more regul... Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, I live yeah. in Boulder, so as you can imagine, I live a very <laughs> conflicted life, but... Um, <laughs> but... Uh, no, I mean, I think that, no, but we, I, you know, I've been an investor, I've been on the board of companies that have been sued in various privacy actions. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, in both cases, our specific company was dropped off of those actions, although the actions are ongoing. Um, so it, it's, it's not like it doesn't ever come up. I, I'd make a couple of observa a couple market observations based on what I see uh, as an investor, and I don't, I wouldn't proxy the startup market as a perfect market, but we see 4,000 investment ideas every year, and there's probably... I don't know. We've done a bunch. We've done a bunch of high-profile online advertising stuff, and I don't generally like to tell people I don't. I'm not interested in making any more online advertising investments, even though I think I'm kind of full up on that. Uh, but we see a lot of online advertising, and I was saying to Alicia over lunch, I, I don't. I can't think of a company that I've seen that was trying to create a container for an individual uh, to control the data that they give to a website. And and I, I, I think that's interesting. I've seen a bunch of companies that have worked around, we've seen, I've seen a ton of companies that try to do data targeting, and for purely economic reasons, I've decided not to uh, make an investment in that area. Mm. Um, I'm talking about companies like Blue Kai and AlmondNet and, and people of that category. I've actually seen a bunch of companies that are trying to deal with the problem of publishers allowing their data to leak out into the world, right, by basically allowing all these other advertisers and, and tracking pixels on their, page, on their pages. And, and it's interesting to me the, the imbalance there. I've seen a lot of, so for whatever reason, the, the startup markets in, in advertising are more worried about the publisher losing control of the data that I guess in this, in this worldview they own hmm. about the people that visit their site rather than hmm. companies that are trying to figure out how I should be you know, not leaking my own personal data and using that more effectively to have either a better browsing experience or to otherwise somehow get, you know, some other economic gain for myself. I, I don't know why that is. I'm not drawing over too many conclusions to that. Alicia and I chatted about it earlier. I think she's got some ideas on why, but um, I make that observation just from a purely market perspective. That's really interesting. What I've seen. Alicia, do you want to... Oh, yeah, Actually, yeah, just to answer the question about the publisher, uh, fixing the, the data leakage from publishers, I've always viewed that it's the publisher's responsibility to manage the trust relationship with consumers. So if they're going to open up the door that allows their party advertisers to listen into the conversation taking place between the publishers and the readers, that they need to make sure that that conversation isn't distorted by someone who's not untrustworthy. And so, um, in, in, you know, I think what I'm surprised by is how few consumers punish publishers when they're the ones that open up the door to let all these people listen in, who they don't, the, the readers don't have any trust relationship with, um, and the publisher's the only one who can act as the gatekeeper to that. So it makes complete sense why what that would make sense. Uh, punish. Saying, yeah. if, if a publisher is not trustworthy, I should not tr uh, engage with them. And so, you know, publishers have to win my trust. And if they're opening the doors to a bunch of people who are listening in and going to extract data and use it in ways that I can't know, don't see, and I can't choose, then that's the publisher's responsibility. So uh, this is, this, I'll, I'll move to Alicia for this. That, um, and then I have a, a question for, for Catherine as well. So Alicia, I mean, can you, uh, can you imagine that a regime that forced publishers to enforce to force publishers to be um, live up to that trust relationship with users, right? I mean, so wouldn't that yeah. be better for the ecosystem as a whole? I mean, I'm sort of thinking about the way in which browsers have shouldered so much of the responsibility in this ecosystem, seemingly, and that's sort of what Do Not Track is doing. I mean, can you can you speak to that at all? This is a very sure. good question. Sure. So this is a, one of those wonderful EU versus US deals. Okay. Uh, in the EU, there is more of a sense of if you are the, the data controller, you are what we would call a first party in the US, mm -hmm. then yes, you are responsible for what happens with that data and, and what goes next. 
in the U.S., companies say, there is no way I am taking liability for another corporation's actions. Mm -hmm. I can't be held responsible for what somebody else does with that data. Uh, any system that would put me on the hook for that, I want no part in. So these are two very different approaches. They're both going on concurrently. Um, they'll continue to be, be, I think, taking divergent paths. Okay, so Catherine, um, as Alicia just alluded, Europe has taken a different model here, right? They, they've decided that they, what they want, what they think is the best thing, whether it's for consumers or the ecosystem, um, I think probably they think for consumers, and have done this more direct forms of regulation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what can you tell us about the effect of that on behavioral advertising? Has it had an effect on behavioral advertising, this more direct strategy, and what is the effect of so? Okay, well, thank you so much for that question. So, Why um, have, you, have you written about this? Could you yeah, just write I, a paper on this? Have I, written, have I written a little on this? Yeah, so I've, um, uh, I've actually written a paper which studies how European regulation has affected how well advertising works in Europe relative to the U.S., now, I'm aware there are a lot of legal, it's a legal audience. I won't talk too much about the methodology, but imagine 3 million observations, 10,000 different campaigns we're studying. It's a lot of data, it allows us to be precise, and we're basing it on field tests, which means that we can actually rely that we're not picking up something else going on. And what we find is that after the EU introduced um, its privacy regulation back in 2003-04, we've actually seen a drop in advertising effectiveness in Europe of around 65%. So that's a really quite large impact. Where effectiveness means what exactly? Sorry. Effectiveness means the ability, what we're measuring is the difference between someone who is exposed to an ad and someone who is randomly not exposed to an ad and how likely they are to purchase the product. Mm. So you actually follow them all the way through to the purchase, not just clicking on the ad? So no, what we're, what we're actually tracking is we're surveying them on their purchase intent. Uh -huh. That's what we use. This tends to be the metric we use in, so in marketing. So self-reported data? So what it is, is it's actually collected by a very large media metrics uh, company. And what they do is, for a lot of products online, you know, they purchase offline. So we actually need a way of tracking whether or not advertising is working in terms of persuading people. And so this, what this, the way this data is collected, I'm sure you've experienced it, you're browsing the internet, little pop-up window comes, and they ask you various survey questions. Mm. Mm. Go ahead, sorry. Okay, so, so given that, so we find when we use this metric that there's a 65% drop. Now, that might be suggestive about the potential impact of regulation on the scope of the advertising supported internet. I think what's also interesting is what kind of websites and what kind of ads were particularly affected by regulation. The ads that were particularly affected were the small, subtle ads. Ads which were the blaring ones, the video ads, the ones that took over your websites, they were just as effective before and after the regulation. Everyone always loves those, They're regardless of, yeah. So the, one, the, the ads that people, dare I say it, particularly dislike, they weren't affected by the regulation. Interesting. The ones that we might be more willing to live with, they were the ones that were heard, and I think that's because, well, these ads need to be informative, right, um, it to work. And the other kind of uh, you know, thing we noticed was diff different publishers were affected in different ways. Baby websites, travel websites, they continue perfectly well after regulation was introduced. Why? Well, you're still advertising diapers before and after the regulation. Mm. The kind of websites that were particularly adversely affected were websites such as news websites, uh, media service websites, government or political websites. Mm. And why? Well, when someone turns up at the front page of CNN, it's difficult necessarily to know what to advertise to them. So let me ask you this, as, as our, um, well, you're, you're one of our resident economists, I guess, but I, I want to ask this, I mean, is there, in your, in your view, is there any connection between effectiveness and economic impact on the overall behavioral advertising market? In other words, you could imagine that you could reduce efficacy, but not actually end up affecting how dollars get spent. Um, okay. any, any linkage there? I, know, I don't know if you've studied that or not, um, but... Okay, so... I think the question, so if really we have don't. a drop of 65% in efficacy, there's going to be, the question is really, who does it affect? Yeah. Is it the case that advertisers just keep on spending more dollars to achieve the same amount than before? 
Or is it the case that they pull their advertising out of online markets and offline? Hmm. And so I don't actually know how the particular burden <coughs> is distributed. I'm just saying there is a burden. And yeah. I think it's going to be one thing we're trying to do right now is try and qualify something about whether or not we see people pulling ads after the recent tightening of European regulation. But let me try to give you some in, very yes, specific yeah, numbers there. Yeah, okay. So yeah. we, you know, we're investors in uh, in uh, supply yeah. side platforms, so yeah. where people uh, publishers aggregate uh, impressions so people can buy them, and also in a demand side platform and a bunch of other things in between. And the actual currently the difference between a um, an impression with data, an impression without data in terms of the, the actual price of that impression is between three and ten times. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's, so it's pretty, now it's, you know, search intent data is yeah. more valuable than, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sort of general demographic data, and, and so there's a hierarchy here, and of course it depends on the placement, and there's all sorts of mm -hmm. other, other variables, but I, I actually looked that up, mm -hmm. at, and I tried to figure it out from both the demand and the supply side, mm -hmm. in terms of what bids we're making on the demand side, as well as what, what we're fulfilling at on the supply side, um, and that's the, that's the answer right now. Well, whether that reflects the true economic value, or we're in a little bit of an aberration because you know the markets haven't re reached an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but that's the current equilibrium. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to Alicia in one second. So, the, but that would seem to suggest then that if you reduce the efficacy of these ads, you don't get the same value difference. Here's the here is the problem with online advertising. Um, branded mm -hmm. o brand online advertising isn't very effective. And so online advertising, and that's unfortunate, right? I mean, it's just, you know, when you want to, if you want to execute an effective brand campaign, you're still better off doing it on television than you are doing it on online. And people are trying to figure out all these different, you know, pop-up and video ads and all these different ways to make it more effective. Unfortunately, it's not a great venue for brand advertising. And there will always be some brand advertising. And certainly if I was a sales rep for the New York Times, I'd be pitching brand, brand advertising left and right, and I'd be selling it. Um, so unfortunately, it's, uh, the internet relies pretty heavily on, uh, on direct response type of advertising, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm, I want someone to actually take an action. Um, and there's all these sorts of attribution models. There's this whole area of internet advertising that's, that's being developed around how to actually track, you know, Alicia saw this ad and then these other five ads, and then, and then what did she do in terms of a purchase behavior? But I think that's partially what's driving these massive differences in economics and why there's this huge industry that's built up around behavioral advertising. Because if brand advertising worked online, really, as well as it works on TV, or at least as well as TV marketers claim it works, I think there would be less of an economic impact of uh, knowing exactly who's, who's uh, visiting your website. Okay, Alicia, sorry, yeah? So the paper that you wrote is, uh, has been highly controversial. Um, one of the questions that I had for you was, what legislation do you think was involved that you're pointing to as being causal? Uh, the e-privacy directive, the, the new version, isn't being enforced. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what you think happened there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think you've raised a good point, right? Which mm -hmm. is that, so we're studying the introduction um, of the 2002 e-privacy directive. And one thing that's been really quite noticeable about the interpretation of that is that there's been a lot of disputes, right, about mm -hmm. how strictly it should be interpreted. So I think a good way of interpreting our results is quite simply, this is the effect of a legislation where people were uncertain about how to actually implement it. Mm -hmm. We've talked to various advertisers. Some people took it very seriously. Some advertisers didn't. We're kind of picking up the average response. Hmm. So what is it that you saw from those who took it very seriously? What did you see change? OK. So now I want to be clear. We don't actually measure or have any data mm -hmm. on the use of beacons or cookies. Mm -hmm. But what we, what we really saw was, uh, from talking to people, is a pulling away from the use of various different tracking devices and cookies when using, um, when trying to do behavioral targeting. I think one result I'd like to highlight, mm -hmm. which I think speaks to the legislation, is that the legislation is particularly strict on health, right, or health data. Mm -hmm. And when we actually look on the data, we've seen you actually get a huge drop in the efficacy, particularly, of health-type ads, and the, or ads for pharmaceutical products. And so, I mean, for that, for me, is evidence at least that in some ways the effect we're picking up 
does correspond to the actual wording mm -hmm. of the legislation in that as much as we can test when we, what we have in the data, you know, does seem to reflect uh, so, what the legislation was at least trying to accomplish. So a different interpretation of that would be good news privacy advocates, regulation can work. Well, let me, let me ask that in a different way, Alicia. Uh, I mean, let me, ask, let me ask Eric, unless you want to respond, Catherine. I don't, I don't want to cut you off if you um, want to respond. Uh, but so, so I would love to respond go, go, to go that. Yes, I think, means, yeah. mm -hmm. I think, Alicia, you, you're you exactly into, yeah. right in that people, I think Alessandro actually discussed my paper mm -hmm. um, at an economics conference, and that was his interpretation too, right? Mm -hmm. um, that privacy regulation works. Um, or we do can. actually, or can work, can, right? can, yeah. at least can work, and that's mm -hmm. certainly, in, it's not the way I know my paper's been spoken about mm -hmm. in Washington, mm -hmm. but I think that would be a perfectly valid interpretation. But okay. uh, Alicia, yeah. what, what do you mean by it can work? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it solves one problem, but maybe creates a series of others. So yeah. you have a normative goal there that you might want to make more express. Well, what what kinds of problems does it create, Eric? I mean, what kinds of problems do you think that it might create? Well, right. So what happens when advertising is less effective? So we have a series of implications from that. So we have, as uh, Catherine's paper, I think, aptly points out, we'll have incentives for people to push towards more intrusive advertising as opposed to less intrusive advertising. Some of you might be there as a good goal. Uh, that's a normative implication. Um, another is that uh, there will be simply transactions that will be foreclosed. There would have been matches that would have been made in the marketplace because these ads are reaching the right audience that now they will be unable to reach the right audience. And so those transactions are gone. Um, that's, again, a normative goal. It's a redistributive effect in a sense. Um, uh, some people don't get the goods and services that they want. Some advertisers don't make the money that they want um, because the regulation foreclosed those conversations or those matches from taking place in the first place. Um, so those are some of the adverse effects I see, but that's a, that, I think really, Alicia, I'd, I'd like you to be more expressed. It says it works, it works to accomplish what normative goal? So um, actually, if Ryan will permit this, I'm seeing Alessandro just desperately wanting to jump I, in. I will the permit, I'll open an outside <laughs> voice, Alessandro. Um, uh, uh, also, okay, yeah. We very clearly admit that without an uh, equilibrium model, we cannot know exactly what the welfare consequences are, because perhaps investment in advertising increases, perhaps it increases. Perhaps consumers will not ask to buy the product, perhaps they will buy it from another provider at a lower price. We don't know. Yeah. So if I could, if I could answer, answer what I meant by works, um, mm -hmm. was has an effect. Mm -hmm. And if in this case the effect was fewer beacons, fewer tracking devices for things that are about medical data, mm -hmm. um, then it has an effect that is probably privacy protective and preserving, not necessarily. For example, we have no idea, did that mean that people move to fingerprinting, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's not enough data from the system to be able to answer that, but has an effect. Mm -hmm. There are people who've argued that there is no effect that can come, that regulation is useless, that regulation is immediately out of date, and therefore there's no point in worrying about it. Um, so that's what I meant by works, was not, the world is better if people have a harder time finding what they're looking for. Well, what I meant was it has some effect, it does affect the ecosystem, it is worth considering as a tool, and looking at all of those trade-offs, which uh, are very I, real. Yeah, I don't think there would be any dispute that regulation has effect in the marketplace. Um, there there it, has been. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, I mean, it always, uh, you know, uh, like any just straight coast there, I mean, put the rule down and people are going to uh, work around it. Um, so, uh, so that part's the easy part. The question then is, um, is that a good thing, right? So if we say, okay, we, you know, the EU regulators screwed it up really bad, they had an effect, um, we might say that was actually something we'd want to avoid. Okay, so I'm going to stay on this topic, but I'm going to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Laura about the innovation effects of something like the EU directive, assuming that it actually has this effect of making um, behavioral advertising less, less effective. So one, one story could be that um, people are doing behavioral advertising because that's just what somebody came up with and it seemed to be working pretty well and nobody bothered to sort out whether there was a better way to do it and when I say better I mean simultaneously better in the sense of more effective in uh, 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 reaching people who want the advertisements and also more privacy protective, right? So for you, the question for you, Laura, is is there a possibility that, that legislation that, that for, even arbitrarily forecloses on what's happening right now will yield innovation? You look skeptical. Let me give you one example. You look skeptical, yeah. All right, so that, for those of you at home, you look skeptical. Uh, so let me give you an example. So this is, this is, I'll make this more forceful. All right, so 
uh, Genio is uh, an Israeli startup, and Genio does behavioral targeting in a big, big way, but they do it all on the client side, meaning all of the information stays on your computer and doesn't go out into the ecosystem, but that allows them to do highly, highly you know, sort of targeted ads, but the data never leaves your control, and in fact, they say they, can, they have even better yield than, than tr traditional behavioral advertising. So what if the effect of this sort of EU model were to push us to think about whether there's other ways we might be able to do this thing called online advertising, Laura? Uh, then that would mean that we got lucky. So uh. just uh, the, uh, making the face because you, uh, you, you would, by saying you can't do this, um, you're uh, just kind of from an optimization framework, you're putting a constraint on something. You're, you're, going, you're going to do worse. You're, you're, um, you, you have limited the set of possibilities. You can't do this. So maybe that will, you know, maybe it, uh, necessity is the mother of invention is sort of what you're proposing. Sure. I mean, that's possible. But it's but, lucky. It's not the best way to do innovation right, policy. Right. Can, can, you so. speak, can you speak a little bit about um, what creates the right conditions? For, I know this is a very broad question, and feel free to, to push it back on me. But I mean, you know, what, what are some of the conditions that are ideal for sort of innovating? Where, what I mean by innovating is, uh, is having people test out new methods of doing things. And maybe this is a question a little bit for Seth as well. Um, you know, how do you incentivize new startups, new players to use different methods and thereby for them move us forward? And you have an answer too. Okay, good. I, so you I, want to I start? Don't, I need to think okay, so. so Seth and then Eric. Well, I think for to a large extent the markets do do that, right? I mean, they're you know the the advertising okay. industry is a five hundred billion dollar industry, and and the oldest adage in advertising is that half the money is wasted. We just don't know which half. Mm -hmm. And and there has been untold amounts of money spent, and and in some cases to good ends, in some cases not, uh, trying to solve that problem. But it's not that the pie is not big enough to incent people to want to. To, to want to work on the problem. I think that, so I don't think that is the issue. I think that we do, and, and there will be other things, right? I mean, without question, uh, there will be something beyond behavioral advertising that people work on. One of the interesting short-term problems right now, and you kind of highlighted in your question, is that the data container problem is best solved on the client side, but the actual advertising problem is solved on the, on the server side. And with a higher per percentage of advertising decisions being made, essentially in real time, meaning in 120 milliseconds or less, that actually doesn't give enough time for, for companies like, uh, like this Israeli company to make an action a decision, transmit that back to the ad server that's making the decision in the cloud, and then to trans transmit that then again back to the other ad server that's making the, uh, the fulfillment. So it's a real challenge. Some of this stuff will be solved by technology. Some of it will be solved by clear regulatory frameworks, you know, whatever, what have you. But I, I don't, it's not that there's not incentive in the marketplace. So you're saying you want more uh, re regulation sense. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eric, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Um, just, just to go back, I mean, I completely I agree with Seth. <laughs> He's that, not saying that. Seth, Seth is not if, saying if that. You, right. If a company comes up with a way of giving better ad targeting and less privacy problems, yeah. that company will win the marketplace, and there's plenty of payoff to motivate people to try and solve that problem. Do we think, I mean, really, though, Eric, I mean, do we, do we really think, I mean, other than Barron, do we really think that consumers are, are really going <laughs> to... Hey, 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 don't <laughs> make me agree with Barron. No, I'm not. I'm not making you agree with Barron. I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't inflict that on, yeah. on you, no. I, I agree with Barron on a lot, on a lot more stuff uh, than, than I, I, I ever <laughs> thought. Than I ever thought, and, and than you. No, exactly. Um, no, but the question is, I mean, do we really think, though, that um, firms are going to be in a position to not only uh, improve on privacy, but actually convey that to consumers in a way that will make them make choices? Well, your hypo said they're also going to do better job for advertisers. Uh, that, uh, that, if they, that is the... Um, uh, the innovation that will win in the marketplace. That's the time. true. I follow and how that so, would happen. But so you, that that's the easy part. If yeah. that happens and it does it with less privacy, which means that then there's not these problems like the publishers having to worry about their adverse relationships with their advertisers, then even better yet. Still, that seems like an easy thing. But I just want to go back to your question, which is, what can we do to to motivate innovation in this marketplace? And there are a number of things. And regulation actually does have the effect of giving uh, uh, creating new pockets of money that people can go pursue that does spur some innovation. But in my opinion, the better innovation uh, regulation is actually to create immunities or safe harbors. To actually say there's a space of activity here where we're not going to let the plaintiff's lawyers go and tear into innovators in the marketplace. We're going to give them some breathing room to try out different things. And so if you look at what's happening today, every innovator in the advertising and privacy uh, marketplace um, who uh, has any 
uh, cloud over them just gets swarmed over by the privacy lawyers. And that becomes a tax on innovation. And so from my perspective, what we can do actually to facilitate the experimentation that might lead to the one that both improves relevancy and improves privacy is help encourage a marketplace where lots of different models are explored. Hmm. And I'll, Laura, just, yeah. I'll just add one thing. Well, actually, I'll well, comment on, on Eric's point. Um, I, I was going to respond what can be done, and I was going to be with Seth on this and say it doesn't seem obvious to me that regulation is is going to help. Um, but the way Eric described it as you know it could this idea of the safe harbor, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Um, but uh, in terms of what can be done to encourage this, um, to me there's a a certain marriage that has to happen between uh, the people thinking about the business models and um, and the people who understand the technology. Um, because you know like I was describing earlier. Um, I don't understand why we don't see, when I click on that, on that triangle I, I don't understand why I don't see the uh, information that answers the question I have of why did I see this ad. Is it a technical reason? Um, so, you know, there's, hmm. you know, there could be uh, technical complexity underneath there uh, that, um, you know, that, that is, a, is a hurdle and, um, you know, and we need we need people trained in business um, who can understand the technology. Too. The, the actual decision making is some, oftentimes, not always, somewhat abstracted. So it is true in some, in some cases that the entity that ends up serving the ad is not mm -hmm. the entity that made the decision about what ad to serve. And it has, there's, no, there's no permanent connection there in, in a sense that mm -hmm. there's no way to actually track it all the way back. Hey, you are seeing this ad because you were in a blue Kai segment that related to uh, Alaska travel, I think was your example. Um, let me ask the panelists a question, if I could. I was, I was doing a little research, um, since I figured everyone would come very fully armed, right? I, I spend my days in the markets, not, not, uh, and I'm not as familiar with some of the papers you guys are talking about, although I've now, I think, read a handful of uh, papers from my, my panelists. One of the things I was wondering, there, there are a bunch of technologies that exist today that are very easy to use, that are consumer-driven, that are client-side, that enable me to browse anonymously. I can turn off cookies. That's probably not the easiest thing to do, and maybe that's just a little bit too technical. Um, every browser that exists has, in a top-level menu, the ability to turn on something called private browsing or some derivative of that name that allows you to browse anonymously. And it turns out, when you look at what people do, um, very few people, which is to say around 5% of people, actually ever turn it on. And when people turn it on, it's, the studies actually suggest that they don't turn it on because they're trying to avoid advertising. They tend to turn it on in the middle of the day because presumably they don't want their employer, I guess, knowing where they're browsing, you know, on personal, like over their lunch hour, right? The, the most common time for people to turn on private browsing is over noon. Um, I, I have some, um, I have some th own, my own theories, but I'd love to sort of understand from the panelists. And I think we've, we've made this implicit assumption here that people care a lot about privacy and about the data that they're transmitting around the internet. Um, and certainly for some forms of data, I was on a, I don't know, diabetes site, but I don't necessarily want my, uh, my hypothetical insurance provider to, to know that information. But the types, of, the types of data we're talking about here are, are, I would argue, relatively innocuous, right? They are, they're, they're, we're talking about advertising, right? We're talking about broad, relatively broad segments. And if you actually saw the segment information in terms of how, how these data service providers segment uh, their data, they are very broad, surprisingly so. I think I, sometimes we sort of get in here, we're like, God, they know everything about me. They know I want to, you know, do this one thing on this day. And it's, it's actually not, generally speaking, it's not, other than in first party cases, not that specific. So I'd love to get people's thoughts on that because there there are tools that people can use relatively easily to to obscure their browsing and no one uses them. So that, that's a good question, and, and let me just complicate that a little bit though and say that uh, you know millions of people, or at least Firefox users, have downloaded AdBlock Plus. The purpose of which, given that it's called AdBlock, is probably to block advertisements and not to. No, I'm just the whole, well, no, I'm going to support yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. The whole, if you actually recall back, Firefox became popular because of its ad block, yeah. its anti-pop-up feature. That sure. was the feature that caused 10% so of the market to It doesn't disagree with anything you're saying, yeah. it's just the added. So can yeah, no, that's a great point. Catherine, do you want to weigh in on that and then Alicia? Did, Catherine, do you? Oh, yes, no, no, I think, I think that's brought up a really good point, which is this idea um, of, I guess, consumer empowerment control when it comes to adver ad advertisements and the extent to which that actually affects people's behavior. 
And I would like to use this as a platform to mention another study I have, <laughs> which <laughs> is actually about precisely that, which is where we look at the introduction of various degrees of privacy controls on Facebook to see how that affects how well advertising works. And what we see there is that actually introducing these controls, which were really about personally identifiable data, actually had a positive effect in terms of how the extent to which people were clicking on ads. And so that, for me, would be suggestive that there is certainly merit towards poor technologies, which are about the empowerment of consumers, and they could actually potentially be beneficial uh, for advertisers in terms of consumer response. I've heard anecdotally mm -hmm. from Google that people who go to its ad preference manager, which shows you the guesses it made about you, that most people that go to that, most is a sloppy word, but that many people that go to it um, actually uh, don't opt out but rather change it. Say, I don't, I don't like tennis, I like soccer. You know what I mean? Which ends up giving sort of Google better uh -huh. stuff. So anyway, Alicia, do you want to uh, respond as well? So in print, I've seen four to one of the ratio for, for Google of people changing the categories they're in, whether that's to make them more accurate or less accurate, who knows, mm, uh, versus just opting out. Right, so four to one. Um, hmm. In terms of controls and browser-based and even non-browser-based, uh, we have two different things going on at the same time here. We have populations who are concerned with advertising and don't wish to receive it. Um, advertising is an interesting thing from an economic perspective. Is it a good or a bad? Would people pay to have advertising or pay to avoid it? And the answer is yes. Right? In some contexts, people like ads and in some contexts, they don't. But what we've seen is the dominant effect for why people are blocking ads is actually not that they don't want to see ads, it's that they have privacy concerns. Hmm. So when I talk to people in lab studies, they tell me, well, companies have to make a living, right? I mean, they, they, they need some sort of financial model for there to be content. They like the idea that they get free content, they like the idea that ads support that content, they generally do not know that the data is back behind the ads and they are horrified at the concept of that. And part of that has to do with their offline mental models. People think offline that they see ads that have nothing to do with them personally. Not always true, right? But that's their model, that they open a magazine, there's an ad, it had nothing to do with who they are. So why doesn't the web work that way? And in fact, until comparatively recently, the web did work that way. So you have a huge level of lack of understanding of what these data models are. That's one barrier to using techniques to preserve privacy when you don't realize there's anything you need to preserve. Um, there's another barrier that they think there are laws in place that protect them. Uh, Peter Swire and, and Chris Hufnagel have done some great work on that. People think that there is baseline legislation already that they're protected by. So again, why would they take action if they're already fine? Um, but there's another piece too, which is that a lot of these tools are just flat out unusable. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, a study from Lori Faith Craner's group that came out recently of all of the privacy tools that they tested, nothing actually worked well. Um, people had uh, problems where they didn't understand why if they blocked cookies, content wouldn't work right. They didn't realize that that was because of the steps they took to block cookies. They didn't know when to turn things on and off. They couldn't manage to navigate this icon that we're hearing about from Laura. There was one person who wanted to do all opt-outs. It took him 75 minutes. Um, there are things along those lines. We have all of the information asymmetry problems that we've been talking about for years. Uh, we're trying something new with Do Not Track. In terms of user adoption on that, uh, we've seen in browser it's about 6%. However, for the Firefox browser on mobile, where we have a, a very self-selected population, right? You have to choose to install a different browser on a particular phone, and you are a geek. If you're running <laughs> Fennec, you're a geek. You know That's you're a it. geek if... Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Um, the adoption for that has been 17% for Do Not Track. Why? Partly because there are so few settings, perhaps, we haven't studied this, but perhaps that when you pull up the settings panel, you get all of the settings and you can see that immediately and there just aren't that many options. Okay, oh, sorry, go ahead, I didn't yeah, mean to cut you off. It. But um, I do want to make sure we get a chance to involve the audience. And so what I was going to ask was for other panelists to weigh in specifically on the question of do not track. 
Um, anything you want to say about that subject, because I want to make sure that if people want to talk through that a little bit, they get a chance. And then I'd like to be able to um, spend a little time with, uh, with our audience here, who, with the exception of uh, Alessandra, have not uh, gotten involved in our panel. So I, I yeah. only want to weigh in on Do Not Track, and then I want to request Alicia to give a nice, concise overview of what it is, the way you did for behavioral advertising. OK. Um, so Do Not Track allows users to put their hand up and say, I'd like privacy, please. Um, it's very different from other approaches to privacy in the past in that it is not a technical me mechanism. It does not delete cookies, it does not delete your browsing history, it doesn't have an immediate effect of something, you click this, that happens. Instead, it sends out an HTTP header, um, so some little bit of information that goes out with every request to a website or resource on the web, and the particular text is dnt colon one, do not track on, it's that simple. And so it's just the user saying, I would prefer privacy to being tracked, please. Okay. That's, that's the effect. So the question is, what do websites do when they get that request? What, what's the minimum that they should do when they get that request? And we're talking about that quite a great deal in a standards process at W3C. Mm -hmm. OK, so people, do you, anyone on the panel have a, a, a desire to weigh in on this question before I, I open it up to, to some Q&A? Um, any, anyone's thoughts? Do you have any thoughts on, on Do Not Track? Or I mean, uh, so the technology is easy. It's a, just a way to allow people to signal their preferences. And uh, there's been a variety of different technologies that have uh, allowed consumers to do that in the past. There were the cookie management tools. There was the uh, P3P, for example. There's been a number of uh, systems. Uh, you know, making it easier solves one problem, but it creates the other. It becomes less semantically clear to the recipient. So. Uh, the devil will be in the details of what do you expect a website to do when the person puts up their hand and says, don't, uh, privacy please. Privacy please could mean a lot of different things to the website and depending on how they interpret it, it could be interesting or not. Uh, so First I time Eric and I have agreed 100% on that. <laughs> <laughs> so yay. Um, all right, so, so on, that, on that beautiful note, I'd really like to open it up a little bit here. Um, and, and, and using, uh, I guess, Phil's rule, uh, we'll start with you for the first question here. So I have Yeah, I just wait for that. Oh, thank you. First, confirm that you are a student at Colorado. Is that so, true? So, according to Phil's rules, I am a student. Okay. Uh, so, in clarification, it sounds like what we're talking about is regulation and privacy and the effect that regulation has on the ability of an advertiser to be effective. And that, that kind of sounds like that's, that's, the, that's the conversation we're having. Is that correct? Um, okay, let's, let's proceed from that uh, assumption. <laughs> okay, so assuming, assuming that that's correct, it sounds like there are almost two different points here. It sounds to me like the public is really further ahead than regulation is. So that talking about regulation as a forcing mechanism isn't really accurate, because what's really happening is the public is do not tracking and using ad blockers, so that any regulation is really just kind of retrospective, and that it sounds to me like what's actually happening that's, that's impairing the advertiser's ability to be effective is not regulation, but it's, it, it's the, the, the basic assumption that TV is out of the user's control. It's out of the audience's control. Print is out of the audience's control, whereas a, a web server, a web you know, uh, browser is very much in their control. So that the paradigm that the advertisers are using now is you know, throw up information using data that they've collected to make that information more attractive, but still they're, they're plastering ads. And if there's a model shift, not a, a, a lessening or increasing of, of regulation, but a model shift in how advertisers deliver these ads to be less intrusive, the, the privacy issue falls largely to the wayside. And I guess the, the question then is, is there an impact in regulation, or are we talking about effectiveness of advertising? Hmm. Does anyone want to want to tackle that as a, as a big? The answer, answer is the, yes. The answer is yes. I think there are four or five questions. I think there are. Do you want to pick? Someone want to pick one? Do you want to answer? That? All right. Okay. So, Catherine, will answer it. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think what you've brought up is 
You can plug another paper, I think. Yeah, plug another paper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Don't forget, forget to get the sites down. We invited to talk about our research. Yeah. <laughs> so, what I think you've brought up is you really nicely pinpointed some of the, I think, things we've been grappling with as a panel. On the one hand, there is evidence that consumers are woefully misinformed about how behavioral advertising is done, and they need protection. On the other hand, there is evidence that perhaps consumers are ahead of regulation, and hence making regulation redundant. Now, I've heard you know, the same, same person sort of you know, talk about both views of how consumers are. And as a marketing professor, that just tells me we've got different consumer segments and we're not thinking, you know, we're trying to have a one, uh, I guess what you call it, a West. monolithic, a monolithic yep. type of regulation assuming all consumers are the same. When really we have a whole heap of different consumers with, who are at different levels of sophistication. Which is why I think Alicia's job is just so tough. Which is also why, at least I would argue, the solu I, mean, I would agree with your premise that the so mm -hmm. solution should be a technology-based solution that allows individuals, mm -hmm. in whatever segment that they are, mm -hmm. to take action. I I'd also note, based on conversation I had over lunch and just sort of thinking about, about what we were talking about this morning, I think that there's a certain portion of what we're talking about that's sort of real and happening today. I think there's a huge portion of what we're talking about that is sort of prospective I don't want to say fear mongering because I don't I, I don't quite mean it that way. But people are really, particularly when you talk about Facebook, people get very emotional about it because there's so much information that you have on Facebook, and there's the, there are questions. We had a great debate over lunch about you know is it even an option to you know delete your Facebook account? One, will they let you delete it or not? And two, you know do you have to from a societal norms perspective if you're 18 have a Facebook account or you're no one? And and so 13, sorry. third yeah third, well, no, but we had a, we actually had a very and, and I actually uh, I thought about this after. After Alicia said this to me, that you know, 18, if you ask an 18-year-old, they will tell you they would rather die. Or, uh, it's, if you don't have a Facebook account, you're dead. You're dead. The you're dead. So, uh, so now everyone has to. But, I, but I, the point I'm trying to make is, I think there's, we are potentially uh, pro. Facebook does such a crappy job at marketing to people, right? I mean, it's just amazing. Facebook generates something on the order of magnitude of 30% of all the display impressions on the entire internet. Yes, re yet represents well less than 5% of all internet advertising dollars. They do a crappy job of monetizing that. So, so just to clarify how, how well they're doing now. So I think there's a little bit that, that's going on in terms of we're really nervous about how people might use the data, not necessarily we're nervous about how people are using the data. And there have been some very high profile examples where companies have misused data and there's been a massive backlash, Beacon uh, for Facebook being the most obvious one. People said, absolutely not, I don't want to do this. And in fact, in Zuckerberg's post the other day about the FTC settlement, he specifically referenced how much they fucked that up. Um, so, so, and there have been other examples where this whole uh, Facebook rap leaf, there was a company that was basically, uh, because of the way that some other people that were in the Facebook e ecosystem were incorrectly passing uh, basically header information, uh, they were taking advantage of uh, an error that people were making and using that to actually correlate effectively PII data. And, and they got put in a box for it, right? I mean, they were, uh, that, that company was really damaged both reputationally and people, uh, companies that we work with that were doing work with them stopped working with them, not because we didn't want the data and couldn't get, you know, make more money, but because they had crossed the line, so. So, so um, I want to make sure to get another, at least another question in here. I just want to confirm, there's nobody from the FCC decency Board. Is there <laughs> you, never, you never know what a flat iron uh, conference it might invite. Yeah. It was expletive. Did it I was, just? Oh, it, was, okay. it was fleeting. It was fleeting. All right. So okay. So uh, you have a question up here in the front, please. Yeah. And and there's a microphone if you don't mind waiting for it. Uh, yeah. Now, shoot. Like I remember what what it was like two times ago. Well, I, I so I think what you guys were talking about, and uh, so what really just struck me was the 5% number of the privacy settings, and, my, and the first thing that came to mind on the browsing, and I think it's totally interesting about the lunch, is it doesn't, that, didn't, that number doesn't surprise me at all, because I think, and how I say it's not sounding obnoxious, I mean, I think most people are just clueless, and so they probably see this as a, you know, incognito browsing as exactly that, and not thinking about the indirect uh, effect it has on advertising, whereas they see ad block for Firefox, and it's very obvious what it is. And, and which then comes back to what you're just saying about who are the users. The vast majority of users are 
are clueless, for lack of a better word. The people who are informed and are thinking about it are going to take the time to download the geeky app or go through, take the time to go through the Facebook privacy settings and actually use it there or not choose Facebook and know about diaspora, which most normal, you know, other people aren't going to have heard of, or you know, whatever it mm -hmm. is. So is the first step not, uh, not, is the first question not about how do we regulate, but how do we educate, how do we make people more aware so then they can make informed choices? So, so and how do you do that? Yeah, so Laura, Laura or Eric or both, um, you know, who's, whose burden is it? Like, who is responsible for, for making sure that consumers aren't clueless? Is it consumers? Is it uh, firms? Is it the FTC? Should no one take that responsibility on? Any thoughts? Uh, so a couple of thoughts about that. Um, first of all, um, there's a certain amount of literacy or digital literacy that's an essential part of being an adult in today's society. And I think we're, we are making progress at recognizing what those things are. And we are, um, I hope, building into our curriculum ways for people to get smarter about that. So for example, on the bullying topic, when I went to school, there was no bullying education. And today, now my kids are getting into bullying education. Can't say it solves a problem, but we've recognized that as an important part of our literacy in our society. Um, I'd like to think that some of the questions that you're raising are also covered by that. Um, but uh, in terms of um, talking about burdens, um, I posted now two different things to the Twitter hashtag um, where I've talked <laughs> about things that are on this topic. Uh, one is about uh, the fact that um, the people who are really motivated, once they understand what they're looking for, they don't need any help from regulation. They'll go fix the problem themselves. And so then we have to wonder, uh, what are we doing here? Are we fixing it for the people who are mo who care but don't act, or we fix it for people who actually don't care whatsoever, and we're actually imposing a different set of rules on them. Um, I've also posted a, a whole issue about uh, the cozying analysis of whether the burden should be on advertisers or on the recipients of advertising to manage their data flows, and so I re refer you to that, that battleship tome. Um, we did, uh, I thought that uh, uh, Joe Farrell's talk today was very helpful to talk about advertising and disclosures as a form of teaching, as a form of educating consumers in the marketplace. And the bottom line remains that it is very hard to teach consumers in the marketplace. That is an extraordinary challenge. And when the, the, the disclosures or advertising is made on a financially self-interested basis, as Joe rightly pointed out, it's going to be even that much harder to get truth in the marketplace. So um, if we assume that there's going to be this kind of education in the marketplace, we need to know what kind of challenge we're facing uh, in doing that. And so um, in that respect, then, um, we might decide a rational choice could be, we say we're not going to assume that we're going to teach consumers to educate themselves. We're going to let the marketplace kind of figure that out for themselves. Consumers who want to know more will figure out more. Um, there will be various ways in which we'll have flashpoints that people will educate mm -hmm. themselves through word of mouth, and the rest we just ignore. Okay, so I, I want to give uh, one last question from the audience. It's going to be Peter Swire. Um, can, you, can you bring the mic over? And I'm sorry that's the last question we probably have time for, but... Uh, Sonia, two points. Um, the first one is when I've talked to browser people, they say that plugins always get a low adoption rate. If you get 5% plugins, you're doing spectacularly well. Just, just to be clear, these, are built, these aren't plugins. They're actually bi functionality built Fine. into the browser. Also, yeah. if you do a non-default thing and see how many people change the cookie settings or go into your, you know, the operating stuff up there, you get very, very low changes from defaults. So relatively, like when, when Alicia said 15%, that's a huge number in this space. And so it shouldn't be taken as an inference that 85% like it just the way it is. Mm -hmm. That's the first point. Mm -hmm. Second point is, uh, <laughs> I wanted to quote Julie Cohen. I don't know if she's... <laughs> Uh, a, a, uh, uh, one of her articles, which is the right to read anonymously. This is an economics panel, and it, there's a lot of reasons to have accurate advertising and reasons why people care about privacy. But one of the biggest uh, uh, sort of themes from a rights point of view when it comes to being on the internet is that if I want to read and have political reading and develop myself, the sense of space that Julie's talking about in her book, that being, having a record of everything I've ever read is very different from our historical experience. It's the kind of thing that sounds more like totalitarianism, just when you think about they have everything I've ever read, and less like some sort of freedom place. And, and so along with the economic discussion, which is the focus of today, there's a whole kind of rights discussion that applies directly here if everywhere I've read is in some database somewhere. I doubt that anyone on this panel would, would argue against the, the user-driven ability to read completely anonymously. I think we would all 
all maybe that's the right way to end. We'd all agree with that completely. Over lunch, you told me that if you're on the internet, the price for that is that you have to be tracked. <laughs> So no, what I said was, no, what I said was, <laughs> why would being on set that go on? That was, 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 no, but to be very clear, what I said was the, the assumption that when, when someone hits a page, there isn't a log that says a browser from this location, et cetera, hits a page. That is a, that's a false assumption. There will always be some footprint, not necessarily a traceable footprint, but a footprint. So I absolutely believe that people should be able to, to browse anonymously to any site that they want to, and that will create a footprint that says a brow you know, this Safari browser from this approximate location went to this website. There, there's, that's just how log files work. That'll never go away, and there will, there will always be some little trace of an activity that happened online. It doesn't have to be traced back to an individual person. Just right. So to clarify what I meant when I said that. Thanks very much. Uh, please join me in, in, in uh, thanking the panel today. Thanks a lot.